But it's after 15, after, and it's pretty short talk, because I imagine there'll be a few questions. So what I'd like to talk about is some of the design challenges, implementation challenges that we faced and solved in building M7. Uh, NAPAR M7 is a HBase compatible, NoSQL database that provides some really surprising characteristics. Before we do that, I'm Ted Dunn. I'm the guy in the red hat. That's how you can tell, red hat. Okay, sometimes I take it off. It's still nearby. I work at MapArt. I uh, also work on a lot of open source uh, software, either through Apache or unofficially. Been involved in open source since before dirt. All we had was rocks. Uh, there's some hashtags. It's not tonight, it's today, but it was tonight when I was writing this, and it seemed right then. So, hashtags, NoSQL now, MapArt, fast. And I'll show you why. So first of all, MapR has a history of just implementing things that run fast. So for instance, last fall, we set the record, the minute sort record and the terasort record, in the end is 1.5 terabytes, 59 seconds on 2,000 nodes. Uh, of course, somebody then at Yahoo put 2,200 nodes on it and edged up that number a little bit. So one of our customers put 300 nodes on it and pushed it even further. It's unofficial, so I'm not allowed to say that. But the fact is, MapR runs faster on less hardware, and the scaling factors get bigger and bigger the more overhead that there is in ordinary Hadoop distributions. And that overhead can come from scale or from applications. So when you're scaling, at, at, at very large size, at terasite size, uh, you, you start having overhead just due to size of the cluster and scheduling and things like that. So the, the advantage that MapR has expands from roughly 2x to, as we saw, as we didn't see officially, I'm supposed to take that out, uh, to about 7x advantage in terms of hardware to hardware speed advantages. And at the same time, MapR has a history of providing lights out sort of things, snapshots, transactionally correct updates, and so on. So that leads us to what is the situation with NoSQL? Because these advantages in raw MapReduce compute, while still presenting a read-write file system, ha, now I've been really here while presenting a read-write file system, while presenting the ability to do tra uh, transactionally correct snapshots, those really ought to be leverageable. And so the prologue to this talk is that HBase is actually really, really good at its core, in its architectural vision, based on Google's big tables, and the design vision is really good. Except a lot of times it isn't so good. And these have to do with the tawdry day-to-day -day implementation details of actually getting it to work. And a lot of the problems have been due to kind of the bad marriage. And I was there when, the, uh, when Jim and, and, and Mike Stack uh, first presented on HBase at the Hub. There were two dozen, three dozen people there. And the problems that they had that first day are some of the problems that they have still years later. And that is that HDFS is intended to solve the problems of large-scale MapReduce and explicitly puts out of scope the problems of read-write real-time update. HBase is trying to compensate for that and it's this bad marriage because HDFS is the only high-performance open source file system for Hadoop. There are many other file systems for Hadoop, but HDFS is really the one that HBase, by its nature, has to target. And yet HDFS, by its own mission, does not intend to support HBase all that well. And indeed, there have been problems. And so, part two, I'm going to talk about the implementation tour of how we use the advantages, the framework advantages, the platform advantages that we had accessible to drive an HBase API, an HBase-like implementation to very, very high performance levels. Uh, I'll talk about all the, well not all, but many of the tricks that we were able to use 
to drive the overheads down, to drive the simplicity into the code, and therefore get very high speed. And then I'll get some honest to God results. These are out of our QA team. These run all the time. So, the, the prologue. So the first question is, there's a lot of NoSQL. Why in the world would you want to do another one? Why does HBase even exist? Well, the fact is, HBase is quite common, especially in a Hadoop environment. About half of our customers were on HBase. Uh, there are issues with that because a very large fraction of our trouble reports are due to HBase. But the core advantage is that as you get larger, as the data gets bigger, the ability to scan data coherently becomes more and more important. And HBase's basic table architecture is rows divided into column families and ordered lexicographically so that row one, row two, row three, they're sorted. And then they're divided across hardware. And this fact that they're sorted according to key means that you can do sequential access. And so very large data sets are best accessed that way. If you're going to do any sort of collective operation on a large data set, you desperately want to be reading it from disk in a sequential fashion. I assign sometimes an interview problem where I ask people what would it take to update 1% of a terabyte? I've got one disk drive sitting here, we've got 100 byte records, I want to update 1% of them. And the naive algorithm, which goes and finds each record and updates it, takes about a month. Yeah. Isn't that horrible? So it's 10 milliseconds to seek, 10 milliseconds to rotate for the read, 10 milliseconds to rotate for the write, times 10 billion. One disk. One disk. But, but, you know, the scaling of many spindles only divides the problem by a reasonably small constant. It doesn't fix the problem. Whereas, if we were to copy the entire database, say 10 gigabytes at a time, into memory, make the changes, and write it back out to the same disk, it takes three to six hours. So, by doing 100 times more work, by reading and writing the entire database, we get a result that's 100 times faster. That's the value of scanning. And that's the value that HBase preserves, even in a parallel environment. HBase also provides, architecturally, a strong consistency model. That means when a write returns, at least in the main API, in, it says the write has been written to multiple machines. And that means that every reader who reads after that write happens will see that value. Furthermore, at the row level, it's atomic, which means that every reader will either see that update or they will not see it. Now, in NoSQL world, one of the first things that people let go of is joins, but very quickly, they tend to let go of the strong consistency model, either purposefully in order to gain resiliency across wide area networking situations, as in Cassandra, or inadvertently due to the fact that they just don't quite get how hard it is to implement parallel systems. HBase by design keeps that assumption, keeps that strong consistency, and that allows the application developer to make assumptions, strong assumptions, about the data. And that's a very valuable thing. Scan works. It does not have to broadcast. It does not have to scan out of order. If you have a short scan, it will go to one server typically, and it will be very, very fast. Uh, Ring-based NoSQL databases, which inherently depend on a hashed key for good balancing and good structuring and good spreading throughout the cluster, just aren't going to do sequential scans that way. Now there are many applications that don't care, but there are also very many applications, especially as the data gets bigger. Because once it's getting bigger, one of the things you want to do is not just point updates, but collective analyses on ranges of data. So HBase has a, a virtue there. It also scales automatically and it scales well. 
it spreads data out as you add new nodes. So it can grow or it can shrink dynamically and fairly efficiently. It's also integrated with Hadoop and it's integrated tightly with MapReduce. These are all great virtues, but there are issues. So for instance, uh, crash recovery takes too long. Uh, mean time to recovery is much too long. May lose edits after a crash. Uh, .meta may not come, dot .meta is just where you know, table metadata is, nothing big there. Uh, th there's a real problem here. It's also very, very complex to assign algorithms. There's classes of problems with the implementation of HBase. Point in time recovery, actual point in time recovery doesn't exist. They have snapshots, but as it said in the discussion of the development, they should really be called fuzzy snapshots, not really point in time snapshots. Data that was written before the snapshot may not appear. Data that was written after the snapshot may appear. So they are kind of a quick referential backup. It's more like CP-RL in Linux. It isn't really a snapshot. There's complex backups, there's bottlenecks, there's manageability issues. So, you know, there's this theoretical entity of HBase, which is wonderful. Here's some, some of the juris that are, are problematic. Uh, when you have failures because HDFS and, and HBase are separated, the data may not wind up where the region is assigned to, so you have non-local data access. You may not use disk space very well because it doesn't have control over head spindles. There's a limited number of tables. Uh, you can only have several tens of tables, maybe a hundred. If you have a thousand developers, that's maybe not what you want. There are lots of operations that are so invasive that you need to do them manually. So there's one called compactions. The performance of HBase is critically dependent on log structured merge trees. What these do is they keep data in memory as long as possible. When they need to flush it, they sort it and write a contiguous file. But then they wind up with all of these parallel files and to find a data element you have to probe vertically through those files in some sense. Your read performance starts to suffer, so you need to merge some of those files. And there are updated versions of data cells in there, so merging them actually reclaims disk space. And that merge process is called compaction, and because HDFS, which is storing the data, is over there, and even in relative to HDFS, the data is stored in a file system that HDFS doesn't control. That arm's length thing means that you can have IO storms very easily. And these compactions can therefore compromise latency dramatically. So that's typically done manually. Splitting is another thing. In our benchmarks that I show later, the, the M7 system will be doing auto-splitting, but HBase is unable to complete the benchmarks if we turn on auto split. So the standard practice is to manually split. You also have to manually <coughs> merge if you want to do the opposite of splitting. Basic administration means that you have to take a table down. There's a slow crash recovery. But if we take HBase 11.11 there, that bug there, that's uh, been superseded now by 58.43. And that depends on all of these jurors. This is an example of the complexity of the problems that HBase faces. To fix the simple problem that HBase takes tens of minutes to come back after taking it down, all of these things have to be fixed. And about 20% of them have been addressed. But these, see so the HDFS, the HDFS, 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 those are the real kickers because HBase doesn't drive HDFS. HDFS has a different master. So these are going to be very hard to solve all of these issues in order to drive down that. Okay. This is the fundamental issue with HBase. And at its heart, the problem is distributed systems. In HBase, we have an HBase master, a region server, we have a zookeeper. We have HDFS, we have the name node. All of these are themselves distributed systems, except the name node, to its shame. Um, and these distributed systems are each hard to get right, 
and collectively, they're enormously hard to get right. For one thing, the failure modes that you have to consider are at least two to the nth. Every component could be in a failure mode or in an operational mode. So if you have n components, you have two to the nth failure scenarios. Clearly, you aren't going to address those explicitly by, by examination of cases. You have to address those logically and formally somehow. But that's hard to do when you have other people changing other code with very loose API contracts. And there is no distributed transaction framework. That's because HDFS never intended to do transactions, never intended to have strong consistency. Well, that leads back on HBase. The Java garbage collection can just wipe out your, uh, your consistency models because not only do you have failure modes, you have partial failure modes where somebody just may have checked out for 20 <coughs> seconds. If they didn't really fail and they're going to be back and they're going to expect to keep on working or they may be slow because of I.O. competition. So this is really, really difficult. As an example, here's just region assignment. All of these communicating messages are required just to do the correct thing. And now we have to, if we're going to do a correct design, consider the case where any or all of these threads of control on any or all of these systems goes wrong. And at its heart, it's HDFS. HDFS splits files into unsynchronized data nodes with a single point of bottleneck, the name node, where all metadata updates have to go. That's called the name node. And this is the fundamental problem. In order to get high update rates, you have to do the updates without involving the name node. The name node is one machine. It can update the file system at about 500 ops per second. And so we dare not tell it that we're updating the, 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 the file system at 100,000 changes per second. We would have an enormous speed up problem or slow down problem. And so this architecture, which is okay for members, is fundamentally flawed for distributed systems that depend on coordination. And there are also memory limitations, things like that. Uh, we have block locations that are mediated by the name node. The name node then keeps track of block reports, which are another start source of IO storms over the network. If you, you have also failure modes, which can freeze the system. And so you have real problems there, scalability problems of many sorts. And the fundamental issue comes down to four design parameters. <clears throat> These design parameters, the unit of IO, should be 4 to 8K. I mean, that's what God and physics intend, right? That's, that's just how disks work. Uh, there's a unit of chunking. That's, that's a good measure of, of how much parallelism we're going to have in I.O. at the node level, not just at the spindle level. That wants to be about 100 megabytes. Big enough to make a difference, but small enough we can do it quickly. We also want a unit of resynchronization. We want that to be gigabytes because we want to make that make a difference, not just on a file level, but on a cluster level. We want to be able to move things around, resynchronize them in large units. So we have three units there. We also want the unit administration. We want to be a large fraction of the cluster to be administrable. Essentially, all of these numbers, especially the ones on the left, are all glued together in the HDFS block size. So there's another issue that we're going to have to face. There, there's the I.O. size, there's the memory size, there's the resync size, and the admin size. HDFS block encodes a lot of these. So by getting rid of that, by distributing the name node, by introducing in particular an intermediate concept, files are broken into pieces, they're put into what we call containers. These are large tens of gigabyte type structures, which are then the units of replication. You're going to see how we can make those give us the things we want. And in particular, here's where we start to see, see there, there's a B tree. 
data structure primitive inside the container. That's the first major, major trick here, is built into the file system itself. There are transactionally updatable features. <coughs> this is a primitive data structure. It's not just an array of bytes that's three levels of abstraction down. It is vtrees that are exposed to the file system implementer. And we can hold millions of these things. And in that benchmark that I mentioned at the beginning, the file system is capable of creating, writing, closing, opening, reading, closing, and deleting four and a half million files in 20 seconds. So we can update the file system. So two architectural limits are now lifted here. One is we can make transactional updates at a very, very high rate in a globally visible way. And two, we have built into the file system not just files, but actual database structures, database primitives. The containers are replicated, there's uh, updates. And so what we're going to do is we're going to implement this with the region entirely inside one container where we have those microtransactions, all the files, all the walls, all the vtrees, bloom filters, and range maps, and everything go into the container there. We get then read-write replication, either chain or star shape, metadata or data can be replicated in these ways, and we have rep transactionally correct updates to these containers. Transactionally correct means that a write that has committed will not appear in a snapshot that occurs after it, and it will come, and if the snapshot occurs before you write that data, the data will be in the snapshot. It's guaranteed that there's an ordering, a, a before and after ordering available there. And so the fact that all writes are synchronous is something that we can use. The basic process is we go to first the container that has a directory, it allocates containers, which are then sprayed into the cluster. And from there, all updates go direct, not involving any central resource, involving only that replication chain. <coughs> and in failure mode, the application doesn't see any of the failures. If we have a failure, the CLDB rearranges the replication structure, and between one transaction and the next, we have, again, a consistent view from the application. So here's the results. This is a tiny cluster. This is also data that's over a year old. You see a constant 15,000 or so ops per second, and these are metadata operations out to a billion files. The circle over there expanded here is ordinary Hadoop distributions, ordinary Hadoop file systems. So this is the raw stuff that I'm talking about today and how we're going to reach very, very high NoSQL performance. So here we go. So here's the outcome. These are the major factors that I've identified in, in what we've done. Yeah? Just I'm trying to get a little line here. So M7, is that a complement to HBase, or is that, is that equivalent to, to HBase with the map artist solution? This is, this is a, so the question is, what is M7? What the fuck? Uh, <laughs> that is the basic question. It's a really confusing thing because MapR runs all the Hadoop ecosystem components. So MapR now has tables built into the file system as a primitive object that expose an HBase API. It can also run HBase at the same time. And in fact, an HBase application can access both native tables and HBase tables at the same time via the same API. And so what is HBase and what is not becomes very, very tricky to, to say correctly. Correctly, the code from Apache Software Foundation is HBase. That is HBase. Now, by common uh, nomenclature, an HBase application is one which uses the HBase API to talk to HBase. But at this point, an HBase application can also be a MapR table uh, application. With the same API. Exactly the same API, except for coprocessors, which are uh, a dangerous concessionation. But this is easy to wind up saying one thing is HBase, which isn't. 
The map are native tables are not HBase. They exhibit the HBase API. Do you intend to make it part of the uh, open source distribution? Well, the problem is open source evolves. It proceeds by small steps, evolutionary steps. If I present a patch in Mahout or Zookeeper or wherever I can do that, I need to have a reasonably bounded patch. I have to say what it does. And people have to read it and understand it. It has to fit into the current system. If we were to do this, we would have a patch that's about a million lines of C++ that spans HDFS, MapReduce, and HBase. It can't be done. Now, we can expose this technology in talks like this. We can expose this technology by contributing to Apache Drill, which is a Java-based system to build high-performance SQL. But it's just infeasible to expose this technology otherwise into these Apache projects. We can give back in other ways. We can, we can find problems in systems, especially since our file system has such different performance characteristics, the race conditions often get stretched very differently than on HDFS. It's actually a contribution to run with different speed constraints. But actually saying here, like I said, a million lines of patch in the wrong language with no management is just an infeasible thing to do. It's not possible. Happy to talk about it, happy to describe it, happy to work with people on it, but it just, it ain't so. So MAPR is revolutionary, where open source is evolutionary. Where open source succeeds is by starting at some revolutionary point and then taking small steps, where everything always works. Where independent efforts succeed is by taking a large discontinuous step, doing what open source doesn't do. They're just two different axes. Right. But there's no real reconciliation possible except after a time, period of time. Like when Google publishes papers, suddenly Hadoop exists. That's the sort of thing that can spawn an open source effort. Okay. Did somebody else raise a hand? I did. So is the code available but just not a patch? No, it's, it, it's, 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 not gonna, it's not even available. I mean, that's silly to, okay, to pretend open source. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just bullshit. Uh, we don't bullshit. It's, it's what we did. We don't want people messing with it. We're not going to be accepting patches. It's the, the stack executive in there has a three nanosecond context switch time. It manages its own stacks and its own threads internally in there, its own queuing system, and basically its own IO system. You don't want normal folks messing with that. It just would be really bad. And so to pretend that it's open source by saying, here, you can look at the code, it's just disingenuous. It is, we're not going to accept that. We're going to be very cautious about updates to it. We have a strenuous internal testing program. And we have an strenuous pre-implementation review process to make sure we don't screw it up, which is just really easy. And it isn't a matter of just making mistakes in the code. There's very subtle interactions across threads, across cores, and across cache consistency. So that three nanosecond context switch time could easily go to 300 if somebody just accesses some other memory incorrectly and pollutes the cache. Suddenly, things that are in the L1 cache and that are known to be in the L1 cache and are assumed to be in the L1 cache are not even in cache anymore at all. And slam, <coughs> two orders of magnitude slow down. And so these are very, very subtle issues. They're not suitable for general use. Now, the abstraction above them is suitable for general use, and it's important to maintain that doctrine. <coughs> so, but I'm happy to talk about it. Say what we learned as we learned. So, starting with MapRFS was natural for us, and it provided huge advantages to us. We started with C++, not Java. The data never moves this way. We have absolute control over positioning. We have control over cache coherency, alignments, a lot of other things. I'll say a bit more. We have a fully lockless design. 
at the low levels. So once a data element hits a queue that it's on its way to disk, there are no more locks. It's locked to one core, and it's just going to slide through, like slops through a pig. It's going to go very fast. And that's where we have the custom queue executive with very, very fast context switch time. It's locked to a particular core on the machine. It's locked into the particular wired pieces of RAM. That becomes very, very stable and very, very tuned into the memory structure over time. We had to re-implement the RPC layer. I'll talk more about that. There's some exciting things there. And that is one example where we are pushing stuff out, pushing it into drift. We also cut out the middleman. In uh, HBase, the, the client talks to HBase, which talks to HDFS, which talks to the file system. In MapR, the client talks to the file system, which has control of the disks. So there's network hops and communication hops and serialization steps that are avoided there. We hybridize the basic log structure merge tree with B trees that we have primitively in there. That allows us to use, at the lowest level, mutation operations on the file system. Those are not a good thing at the large scale, but at the small scale, we can use those to get substantial benefits. I'll talk about that later. We also adjusted the size and fan outs and number of layers in the system to represent the physics of what we have. And then we were silly in a few places, and we fixed that. Uh, so our initial implementations were considerably slower than we expected. Turns out those were some very, very simple silliness that we had. Sorry about this. I love calendar alerts mostly. Most of these things we get almost for free by just implementing inside the file system rather than at two levels above the file system. So, talking about hops, for instance. As I mentioned, the client goes to the region server, the region server goes to the data node, and may have to go to the data node on a different system where there's already a region server. Here, we go to the data server directly. And that, that has advantages, but it has indirect advantages, too. Because data cannot exist without a file server in the MapR system, and because the data on a particular disk will only ever be touched or served by the file server on that machine, that means the problem of data locality is gone. You get to that file server, which is where the primary copy of that table is, and it has control. If that data is moved, you inherently go to a different file server, and that file server is where the data is. So all of the complexity of coordination about who has which region, which region server is handling it, which HDFS are you talking to, is gone. All of that complex sequence diagram that I showed earlier is just gone. So lesson zero, implement the files, implement the tables in the file system. That was the first step. Now, along with that was came this why not job. And I have to say right off the bat, and my name is Ted Dunning, I am a Java bigot. I love it. I think you can do extraordinary things with Java. But when you start looking at really low-level performance code, it's really hard to touch it. Just be C++. Take, for instance, an array of structures. Just that something, something that simple. There is no structure in Java. There are only objects. Objects involve 40 to 50 bytes of overhead. So if I have a struct of two integers, eight bytes of data, I'm going to have 40 bytes of overhead. Now I can re-implement those as multiple arrays and a magic data thing, but then to get that struct out, somehow a reference to those two integers, I wind up creating an object. And so I pay that penalty either in allocation or in static size. On the other hand, C++ is going to have an array of bytes, and it's going to have pointers into those bytes, and it's going to have no overhead on that, except middle overhead. The middle overhead, of, I've got to deallocate this, I've got to allocate it correctly. That's hard. That's work. It's work you don't have to do in Java, but it's work you have to do if you want the element of performance. Now, Drill has taken some of this 
and build some very, very interesting capabilities around how Java can provide a fiction of this. But the fact is, C++, you just do it. You feel the bits between your toes. It's very direct. Also, consider that when data is arriving on the wire, we want it to land in memory exactly once. We never want to copy. In Java, that's really hard. If you use protobufs, for instance, you have a data structure which represents the bytes that have been arrived. So they're already in memory. But then to reference those bits, they get copied out. And if I have an envelope structure which says here's the header and here's the raw data, I copy that envelope structure and then I copy that buffer of the data I want out and then I copy the data out of that. So inherently, again, the Java object structure, which has such huge dividends in, in uh, programmer productivity, kills us on performance unless we go to extreme limits. And again, we've taken that technology and moved it into drill and shown how it actually is possible to do this in Java. We also have a, a problem of, suppose you want to core lock some process, so you have multiple threads of control, each one on a physical core, and you want to lock that there, and you want to absolutely control which data elements are in cache and which are not. Java is abstracted from that. It's essentially impossible to core lock different threads. So this just isn't going to happen. Uh, I've seen the, the disruptor uh, system is able to move blocks of data through a queue, an in-memory queue, from a core to core in 50 nanoseconds. But in that time, we can make 17 transactions. And again, it's purely that really low level, that's almost a similar language, view of the hardware that allows this. And core locking, lock free, zero copy queues, as you wind up violating all of the virtues of Java. We wind up writing C++ effectively in Java. So instead of being an advantage, Java becomes a disadvantage, a huge no stuff. And of course, there's the question of GC, garbage collection, in a real-time system is a major issue. Our system doesn't garbage collect because it explicitly manages. Now, we have to also <coughs> make use of our knowledge of the so the, the MapR system breaks a table into tablets. We, for convenience, call those regions. A tablet is then broken into partitions, which one of which is misspelled, excuse me, and partitions are broken into segments. Now, only the regions are user visible. All of this other stuff is internal to the implementation. But what we do is the fan out at the tablet level is hundreds of thousands. You have an enormous number of tablets. At the partition level, it's thousands. At the segment level, it's adjusted so that we have a very small number of segments per partition so that we can keep all of the active partitions and their segment maps in memory in L1 cache. Secondly, segments themselves are structured so that updates to the segments involve a single disk rotation. There are about one to two megabyte updates there. So what we have is different kinds of fan outs, different appropriate sizes at different levels of the hierarchy. Here, it's absolutely critical that we never do an update that does like 1.1 rotations because that will cause a do. We also never want to do a point to rotation update because that'll cost us 80% of that rotation. It's just a wasted cycle. And so sizing this is critical for performance. And splitting widely at the top is also critical. So having enough layers, but not a variable number of layers, so that we can control the sizing at the bottom and the fan out at the top is critical to our performance, yeah. What's the difference between public and partition and so on? These are just different data structures that have different ways of indexing their contents and accessing the, the, their individual constituents. The ta table structure is merely key ranges, and it has a file identifier, a primitive file identifier, that says in that container over there is a tablet. 
Oh, it's arranged by this. Yes. The tablet now has something similar, but it no longer has non-local references. It refers primarily to partitions in the SAM container. Not always, but almost always. Could the tablets be a different uh, uh, machine, so to speak? Each tablet is, is well, each, each partition is on a single uh, storage pool in a single container. Tablets can be spread around a little bit more, but usually they wind up on a single node. Very, very strong preference for that. There's, there's processes that ensure that. And so you can view it as, at the tablet level, we break down to a single node. Now, there are many more tablets than there are nodes, and so many tablets wind up on one node, but each tablet is limited. Do you have any data on the page? One segment. Yeah, if we want to update one segment, we do that pretty much in place. Locally. And that, that's where the read write file system becomes a huge advantage. Yeah, totally. How sensitive are these references to differences in hardware? Like we're on a chip which has, you know, an L1 cache which is twice the size of another chip. So uh, we adapt to that. We, we measure it. We don't want to measure it. We observe it. You, you probe it, and then we adapt. So uh, differences in L1, L2, L3 cache sizes are random. Also differences in different memory hierarchy bandwidths change, and those change parameters. Yeah, now at the disk level, the world is a little bit simpler. Within a factor of two to three, disks all rotate at about the same speed. And they have about the same size cylinder, and, and, and are striped roughly about the same way within our file system. And so we can view disks, spinning disks, as one kind of thing. There aren't any parameters that need to be adjusted at that point. Then when we run on SSDs, and I can show you, which I don't know that I have any numbers for that, but when we run on SSDs, we can just ignore those needs for the hard disks. We can pretend they still exist. They don't hurt us at all because it's still a reasonable way to update an SSD. SSDs do add costs for non-continuous small updates. And so it turns out okay to not adapt at that level of battle. It's at the processor really tight, bit twiddling sort of thing that really matters. And especially which key structures we cache in memory. Being able to control cache and memory residency and to force key structures into memory, secondarily prioritize locked in memory column families, and then thirdly to keep data in memory as convenient is absolutely critical. That allows single disk read reads and can make you know, factor five or more difference in performance at read time. And then unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, I mean, it's unfortunate for the HBase side of the world because Again, at arm's length, HBase cannot force that. It cannot force the disk subsystem to cache different data structures differently. It can do an F advise on HBase or HDFS data in general. But it cannot say, this is a B-tree index. It must be in memory. And that is data it could be cached. It just can't say that because it's too far away. When we're in the same image, it's easy. But that's a critical, critical performance thing. And it's also a critical scaling factor because it means that we can keep the critical data in memory. So as data expands far larger than memory, we really have to prioritize and keep the right bits in memory. Another factor there is updates and reads in our system go to the primary. So you gain performance by sharding more narrowly rather than replicating on reads. That means that we get actually a huge advantage because we cache only on the master, not on the replicas. That means the replicas have their memory free to cache the things that they are master for. It effectively triples the amount of memory that we have in a cluster. And the amount of data, unique data in memory, is the key performance indicator for a particular size cluster. 
there, there's just nothing else that compares to how many rows can you keep in memory. And by only by differentially caching on the primary and the secondary, again, not a thing that HBase can control, but a thing that we can control, we gain a factor of three in memory. And so we don't normally run memory borderline tests. We normally run, run memory resident SSD and hard disk resident tests, because we want to go to streams. But at the borderline, that makes a huge difference to scalability and performance. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, SSDs. Uh, I understand there are two main categories for those storage rates. Yeah. SLC and MLC. And we don't have to distinguish at this point. Oh, yes. I'm being told that we need to hippie hop. So I'm going to move along. Physics, good idea. The protobuf for implementation was critical. He's cutting me off. Uh, I'm going to show the performance numbers anyway. These slides will be up there very shortly on the line. These numbers are throughput, MapR, HBase. These numbers are latency. You can't see MapR's latency. Here's a mixed load again, different arrangements. You've seen the same basic idea. Here's a magnified view. This is HBase latency. We just magnified by 20x. Is that compaction spikes? It's all kinds of things spikes. It's it, it, lack of control spikes. Selection, all that stuff. Yeah, it's the fact that HBase can't control its own universe. And there's the map our latency. And in fact, these latency spikes are roughly 10x worse than they are because they are averages over 10 seconds. Typically, you have a few transactions that have high latency. And so the actual latency there is much higher. It's being diluted by at least 10x by the average effect. So there's our recap. You can get in touch with me. I'm sorry that we only have 45 minutes. But uh, that's the money side. That's, we can produce much higher performance numbers by controlling our universe. And this is available right now, anytime you need it. Uh, we can step outside and we can do some more questions out there if you'd like. And I assume there's another speaker coming in, that's why I'm being waved. Okay.